I've been thinking a lot about the the limitations, let's call it, of advertising a brick and mortar business. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you're selling, you know, a widget on online on the internet, uh, then everybody potentially in the United States, in North America, in the in the world is a potential buyer. Yeah. But when we're talking about brick and mortar local businesses, right? The uh, the coffee shop on the corner, the uh, studio that teaches mu music, and of course our clients' dance studios. There are some very real limitations around that, and I just wanted to have a, a conversation today for our listeners, uh, kind of expectation setting. Like, what are those challenges? What are the limitations? And then, what can you expect from advertising a, a local brick and mortar? Because it does work. It's just different. And so, I wanted it to is. chat about that today. Yeah, I mean, it's such a. I mean, let's just start with audience size. You, you said it there first. Like, if you're selling a widget, let's say a car let's call it the new ford f-150 there's buyers for that all over the world and so the mm -hmm. audience size is millions and millions and millions of people and for a local brick and mortar business your audience is residents within a 10 minute drive to your studio and so that's like we're talking about right. tens of thousands compared to millions and so just gotta understand that the total addressable audience that you can market to is so much smaller and that just having that frame of mind is going to impact how you how much you spend on advertising what kind of ads you have to show all that really changes with a local brick and mortar business and so that's why a lot of the things that these marketing gurus that come from backgrounds of the big brands they say here's what you got to do it doesn't really work for a local brick and mortar business you really have to alter a lot of those strategies for them to actually work for you. So that's why it's just, there's sense being made in a lot of the marketing advice out there, but it doesn't consider the local brick and mortar business. Like let's just start there. Mm. Well, let's talk about that radius for first and foremost, because it's an, it's a really, really important number that you do need to know or be experimenting with in in your market and and the bottom line is uh, and i use the example all the time like if i want pizza if i like if i want to get some pizza by my house there's a domino's that's 90 seconds away there's a um then there's like a scratch kitchen probably about 15 minutes away and depending on what i'm in the mood for i will either do the 90 second drive or the 15 minute drive but there's also an amazing pizza place 90 minutes from here, and I'm not going there on the regular basis. There's just, mm -hmm. there are constraints. There are time and distance constraints when we're talking about yeah. dance studios. And even if you try to order pizza from them, they would say, I'm sorry, we don't deliver to that address. Like they actually know their physical limitations where it's not worth to them dollars and cents to deliver a pizza, even if someone was trying to buy it and they're too far away. So like, they will stop you before you even try to buy something. So like, that's a great example because pizzas, they, if Dom, if you're outside of a delivery radius, they're going to be like, you should nope. call the Domino's in this other town that's closer to you. Um, right. So that's a very real factor. Yeah. And it sure is. And, and, but these radiuses, they're, they're, they're a little bit elastic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in, if you're in midtown Manhattan, your radius is going to look very, very different than if you're in Twin Falls, Idaho, simply because of population densities, uh, of culture, how far people yeah. are willing. To, like, people like don't don't drive in New York. I'm going to take the train yeah. or I'm going to walk, and so that tra changes things. Versus, if you're in the middle of you know nowhere, Texas, people are used to driving 45 minutes for a gallon of of milk at the local Walmart, well, maybe your radius changes. It's not going to be, you know, a set five miles or 10 miles or, or 40 miles. Um, it's, it's going to be a little bit elastic. And so thoughts on how studios that are listening in today can find that sweet spot for themselves, whether it is, you know, one mile, five mile, 20 miles, 50 miles. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, look at your existing customers today. Like if you have a hundred dance students, just go through and I'm sure there's towns that come up more frequently than others. So you know where your hotspots are. Just look at your existing um, audience. Then there's going to be probably like the outliers, people that drive a little bit further away. But really understand what kind of an audience is that. Someone may drive far 
if they're already in year 10 of dance or on your competition team, they're like doing all the advanced stuff because they're coming to you for that specialty training. That isn't an obvious sign to say, let's go get more dancers there because moms with a preschooler probably aren't going to be that committed because they're not at that level yet. And so just like take a look at your, your existing customers, take a look at what are your hot towns um, and even just do a quick Google search on driving radius tools. And you can put in your address and say, show me the map of 10 minute drive for me. And you're going to see, you know, the highways, uh, you can stretch a little bit farther where there's near highways and things like that. Um, so those are a couple of easy ways to identify where you are. Just look at the map and like point out in circle on Google maps where, you know, you pull a lot of students from and then where you get less and less. Cause you're going to start to see your own boundaries of where you can reach from and get new students from. Mm-hmm. The one exception to this is if you, if you're, Offering, and we see that we do see this often enough, where studios are offering um, some sort of specialty level, or it's like really technique based, or it's and it's the only one, and people will drive an hour plus to attend. Again, it's just understanding who your buyer is. That's probably not going to be that first time buyer. That's going to be that fifteen year old who's been dancing for seven years and is looking to level up, and and so mom and dad are, are willing to do a farther drive. Mm-hmm. to come and get that kid the education that they need. But by and large, you're looking at a 10 to maybe 20 minute drive in most cases. I guess in you know Midtown Manhattan, it might be a 20 minute walk, but that's sort of the limit. Like that's really it. Outside of that, we're not going to be attracting a lot of new people. And again, exceptions, you know, exceptions do exist, but by and large, it's a fairly tight radius. And that brings us back to population. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned if I'm selling the new Ford, you know, F-150, I'm selling to millions of people all across the US, North America, and the world. Not the case when we're talking about smaller towns. Right. Not right. the case. So what what have we found? And I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts because you know obviously some some towns have fifty thousand people in them, some towns have twelve thousand people in them, and there's some pretty big differences there. What are your thoughts on kind of po- looking at population size at, in terms of understanding expectations or finding that reach, etc.? So population will just really indicate how often you're going to have to change the creatives of your ads. So if you're in a much smaller populated area, people, you're going to have an easier time reaching everyone with less budget versus someone that has 100,000 parents in their area. So that just means more uh, about having to rotate and show something different. Like you can't use the same picture for a whole month. You got to be rotating ads so people, it looks new and fresh to your audience. So that's one big factor that population plays there too. And then again, budget. If you have a little bit more people, your budget goes a little bit further. Um, In a smaller town, you know, you may need to actually reduce the budget to get results because you don't want to be in the too in the newsfeed too often. You kind of want to find that sweet spot. Um, and of course, people need to see it more than once, but you don't want to overdo it either. That freshness factor, we call it ad fatigue, and it and it really it really does factor into things. And you've probably seen this where if you ever, if you have a commute in your life to either you know studio or pick up the kids or wh- wherever the first time a new billboard goes up you noticed it you saw it after you've driven by it for a month and a half you're not even seeing it anymore you're like oh yeah yeah your brain just takes that information it just says oh i know what that is i don't i don't need to look and it just fades into the background it's the same philosophy i'm assuming with the ads themselves right we want to put the ads up And then make sure that if every person in town sees it 15 times, well, it's just white noise now. The performance is going to go down. They're not going to click on it. They don't see it. You repackage that same offer or build a new offer, put it out there to the same people, but it's shiny, fresh, and new. And so we start to see that the click rate click through rate goes up. We start to see that the cost per lead goes down. Uh, and that's where CPL, if you're looking at your cost per lead, is a great indication of how an ad is performing and when it needs to be swapped out. 
you put out a new ad, it kind of establishes baseline in the first week or so. And then after that, if you're certainly in a smaller market, you'll see it faster. If you're in a larger market, it takes more time. But you will start to see that CPL creep up. And when it hits a threshold that you're no longer comfortable with, swap it out, try something new, mm -hmm. see how it works. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Do you, so you mentioned something about bringing ad budget down in smaller communities. That feels super counterintuitive. Well, first of all, let's back up. What's a smaller community? Well, so with studios and any other marketing advice that you get there, they say, hey, if you have a good cost per lead and you want to double the business, double your ad budget. But a dance, a local brick and mortar business just isn't capable of doing that because we're working with significantly smaller audiences. And so that's where a lot of times we've seen increasing the ad budget actually kind of backfires for a dance studio, whereas lowering it can kind of help reduce that cost per lead. Um, so just got to keep in mind that when you're in a, you just already as a brick and mortar business, you already are in a smaller market. And Again, the common advice out there is spend more to get more doesn't always apply just across the board for a dance studio. Um, and reducing your budget can just kind of help you get potentially something to test. It doesn't work everywhere in every area, but if you're in a more rural, densely least um, rural area, try spending you know five dollars a day instead of ten or fifteen. Like reduce it down and just see what it does to your cost per lead because it may just find a sweet spot with the number of times people see it to take action on that lead. I remember when we, the first time we discovered that in, in our business, we had a campaign. I think they were spending somewhere between 10 and $15 a day and we cut it basically in half and the cost per lead dropped and we didn't have to swap out ads as often. And yeah. the quality of leads also went up because it was just it started the algorithm started to find people who are more likely to say yes to the offer rather than just like shotgunning everybody in town. And I remember being really do you remember this? Like being really surprised. We kind of like looked at surprised. the numbers. Yeah. We looked at each other and we're like, how does this make sense? <laughs> like, we, what, like what happened here? Um, but that has become a a tool in in our arsenal mm -hmm. when in smaller markets. And when I say smaller markets, you're going to need to try different things. You you may be in a smaller market and not even realize that. Um, but yeah, super interesting stuff. All right. So I'm curious, how do you think about, as we're just kind of going through this, you know, rolling through the limitations is ultimately we're looking at even a more niche market. Let's, like, let's be real. We're looking at an even smaller market because we're all, like in most cases, we're looking at parents, which means parents with kids that are like, 10 and under that's yeah. an even smaller subset like it, it, does, is it hopeless at this point for studios to even think about running advertising i know everybody goes to the conferences and everybody says run ads but realistically i mean this just feels like it's a hopeless proposition if there's 20 parents in town or you know 200 parents or 2,000 parents it still feels like it's a losing proposition what do you think about that um i mean i disagree i think just a lot of people are on social media online nowadays um, and advertising is still a direct way to get in front of your potential new and future customers. So um, in my opinion, like advertising is still, we're very much, are, we live online all the time now. And so mm -hmm. no matter what platform we're on, online advertising is not going away anytime soon. Um, but just the type of content and the way we compete for attention is the part that's going to be changing here. But that is never going to go away. We will always be fighting for attention. Um even in 10 years from now, when everyone's in VR goggles, I hope I, for, I hope that never happens. I hope people <laughs> still stay plugged in the real world. But there will probably be some form of advertising in the virtual worlds. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't like thinking about that yet. Um, but that will, I think for as long as humans are alive and capitalism exists and businesses, like there's going to be advertising. And so it is how businesses grow and get in front of new people faster than relying on word of mouth and like waiting for hopes and prayers of someone to drive by you or discover you on their own. Yeah. And that, I mean, 
if, if you've been in business for you know 15, 20, 30 years, 40 years at this point, then you've already seen and witnessed the shift. It used to be that you, you know, you took out print ads in the newspaper. And then when everyone started taking out print ads in the newspaper, you went to postcard mailers. And then when everybody started doing postcard mailers, you got a website. And then when everyone had a website, you started looking at paid placements. And then when, you know, on, 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 I don't even know what it was, Google back in the day. I don't even know. And then when social media came into vogue, well, now we're on Facebook and Instagram and there is an evolution and we do expect, uh, truthfully, it's something that we're talking about internally, not something that we're going to talk about externally yet, but we're already looking at the what's next of, of the world. What happens when Facebook doesn't work anymore? What happens when Instagram doesn't work? And believe you me, that day is coming and it's coming sooner than any of us would truthfully like to accept. Mm -hmm. So it's something mm -hmm. that we're talking about. It's, I can't release, we won't talk about the details of what that evolution looks like just because, and truthfully, we need to prioritize our clients first. They need to hear it first. They need to know what's going on and have the opportunity to pivot and win. Um, if you'd like to be a client, don't hesitate to reach out. We can talk more about some of these things uh, as they evolve and as we you know, release them. But the fundamentals don't change ever. It's people want a thing. People have a thing. It's connecting the buyer with the seller. And that's, that's always going to, to exist mm -hmm. in some form or fashion. Right. Yeah. I remember back to your VR goggles. I remember reading an article how Pepsi uh, used like a, they put like a drone display in the sky with the Pepsi logo over, you know, one of the cities out West. And I was just like, man, if I ever see those, I will become a gun owner real quick and start <laughs> taking them out of the sky. Cause that's not cool. I want to see the stars, please. Um, really interesting stuff. So let me ask this realistically in terms of actual expectations, because we've talked kind of about the negatives of, you know, the challenges of advertising a brick and mortar business. Obviously, it still works and it works and it can work quite well. From your perspective, and then I'll weigh in as well, what can clients expect or what can dance studios that choose to run advertising expect from their online obviously you don't turn on a facebook ad and then like put a down payment on a yacht tomorrow it doesn't work like that right it's it's a slower burn but realistically what are some of the the expectations that they can expect to have well it's a really loaded question because those expectations depend on the system behind it like you can't just run an ad to a website and expect to get results like so there's a lot more you can't just you don't want to just start spending money without having your funnel set up without having your follow-up system set up without having um all that because you can waste a lot of money with ads doing it ineffectively but for studios who have a system set up where you have a clear offer you have ads that communicate the offer clearly you have a landing page to convert that interest into a lead and get them in touch with you and like a crm system to converse and communicate with them you'll expect to get new people who didn't know you existed opting in and requesting to learn more about your offer your programs they're going to want to get started there are going to be a lot of clueless parents they don't know about dance yet they're like beginners and so you're going to have to answer and do a lot of hand holding to these parents to get them in um and it's going to take relationship building it's really you're going to basically if you have everything set up right you will expect new relationships forming with parents reaching out and you have an opportunity to give them a really good customer experience, guide them through the, your, you know, enrollment process, um, whether you're offering mini sessions, trials, paid free, you're just kind of walking them through that clearly to get them in, get their child excited, integrated into the classroom with the right dance where like, that's the beginning of where all that begins. Um, but again, without that system in place, you know, I just want to caution people who are listening. Is cool. I'm going to go take my money and run with ads. You got to have your back end set up without flaws. Otherwise, it will yeah. be putting money out the door. Yeah, and wasted money. And we learned that lesson the hard way. The first camp, yeah. first dance studio campaign we ever ran, we lost like seven hundred some odd dollars, seven hundred and fifty yeah. something dollars on it, because it was exactly that. We turned on an ad that did not have any of the necessary back end to take that lead, which is a human being, 
on the other end. Like that's critical to yeah. understanding. It's a human being and there was no process to take them step by step into becoming a customer. And so it was it was like seven, $750. I don't know, something like that. There's a video on, on YouTube uh, that tells the story. You can go find it. But, but uh, it, is a, it is a buyer beware type scenario. It can work incredibly well. Yeah. We advocate for it, obviously. Uh, we do it for our clients. We do it at the highest level, literally. Um, and that said, even we run into snafus and unexpecteds and things that trip us up, campaigns that just really fail to launch in terms of yeah. creating realistic results. And we do this every day. And so there is a threshold of... I think being aware that it's not a guarantee just because you have an ad out there doesn't mean it's going to work, doesn't mean it's going to produce leads, doesn't mean that those leads are going to turn into trials, never mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the trials will turn into customers. There are a lot of places that people can slip through the cracks in this process. It yeah. is a machine done well. You will grow. You will. Yeah. Um, and one more buyer beware, <laughs> comparing yourself to the others is just going to make you go crazy because... You know, we see these ads and, and people promoting results of like, I got 76 leads for $1.89 a piece, but that's all they're bragging about is the leads. Yeah. You got to know if they're actually turning into customers. Like it's leads is not the only number to care about. It turns into meaningful, ideal, non-headache inducing customers into your studio. Um so just buyer beware out there. Like when you see people saying, oh my God, I got this many leads for my advertising campaign. It could mean nothing, nothing <laughs> unless you know what exactly happened and how many of them actually came in and are paying an ideal clients for that particular business. Cause yeah. Yeah. So just throwing that out there. Don't some, some studios that we work with, they will never see a cost per lead below $25 and yet they're growing every single month because that's their market. That's like the best they can do in that market. You know, with all the factors of competition, of population density, how far people are willing to drive, how their price compared to other dance studios. So many factors. Yeah, are, offer, time of year, like oh, everything, exactly. everything, everything, yeah. Everything. Um, so just because you have a high cost per lead doesn't mean you can't grow, doesn't mean it's not worth it. Just means you gotta know your numbers and do the math and make sure that you are dang good at following up and converting those, those leads that do end up in your inbox because it can still pay off dividends in the long run. And don't worry about those people bragging about cheap leads because cheap leads could be really cheap customers too. <laughs> <laughs> the big head, those headachey ones that you don't want. I mean, and we could almost do an entire episode around like why it makes financial sense to pay more for your ideal, more of your ideal customer versus just the everybody, which is a yeah. ma major mindset shift for a, a lot of studio owners because a lot of them show up and they're like, I just need dancers. It's like, no, you just need the right dancers. And that's a yeah. very different conversation. So maybe that's a, a follow-up to this. Yeah. I mean, we definitely offers and all that stuff can be following because we can even share our own results when we try to do a free trial with Dance Motion Marketing and what and how that compared to just going straight into our paid well, programming. Like that alone well, is worth it. Maybe we should record that one right now because holy smokes, there's some really, really interesting stories around that. Um, yeah, really good stuff. Well, I, we're going to kind of put a bow on this one. I think the short of the long is advertising is not the be all end all. It's not the thing that in, in, in Listen, we we do the, the conference circuit every year. We know everybody stands up on the stage and says, oh, you need to be advertising. And maybe is my response mm -hmm. to that. Maybe you should be advertising. It's going to depend a lot on where you live, what you're trying to accomplish, who your ideal buyers are, uh, that paid ads on Facebook and Instagram may or may not be the right strategy for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what does, if you do pursue the paid ad strategy, is make sure you're doing it with someone who can help you understand what the numbers mean and put them into context. We, we spend a lot of time with our clients, helping them to understand, yeah, your cost per lead went up, but here's what we're also seeing. You know, your... Uh, the number of people who are enrolling also increased versus the number of people who tried and then you never heard from them again. So having a partner to help you think through those numbers is critical. Good luck out there. Stay safe and don't 
open up your credit card and go full bore until you really truly have the systems in place and a thought growth partner in your corner to help you make sense of it all. Mm -hmm. That's it for this week. We'll see you same time, same place next week.